Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Namaste. In quiet, we receive God's word today. Hearing that still, quiet voice, tell us something that we often don't want to hear. We want to believe that the identity we have claimed, the personality, the ego, are solid and real like rock walls. When the truth is, they're anything but solid and they're anything but strong. In fact, given the right opportunity or the right impulse, they'll adapt and change and shift and become something completely different. And if you experiment with that, you'll find it to be true. So today we're going to do something very interesting. First, I want to tell you a story of, of how I discovered this, and then I'm going to sh show you a little clip from a, a movie. So I remember, um, Vicky's going to remember this because this happened when I first moved to Quincy, Massachusetts, uh, or to Boston. Gosh, how long? That was 1994 that we left the academy, went back to Boston. And uh, OK, so here's what happened. I decided that I wanted to see just how strong this ego identity was. So I did something crazy. I. <clears throat> designed three different separate identities very different from my own i may have talked about this before but that's okay i'll talk about it again one was um a a, a homeless uh refugee from bosnia one was a um, an insane street person who couldn't actually speak and the other was a guy, uh, uh, well, a man who was transitioning to become a woman. And I remember I, I gave her the last name of Thomas, which is one of Vicky, Vicky's maiden name. Jamie Thomas, that's who it was. And I actually went out and bought costumes for each one of these characters. For Jamie Thomas, I, I bought a dress, a wig, the shoes, the pantyhose, the makeup, the whole shebang. You remember this, Vicky? <laughs> and I, because I was living at Jim Yost's house at the time in South Boston. Now, I don't know if any of you have, I'm sure you've all seen Goodwill Hunting. Well, most of that takes place in, in South Boston. You need to know South Boston is a very tough neighborhood. And, and here I am every day walking around dressed like Jamie Thomas. And <laughs> I was really lucky I did not get uh, hurt. But what I would do is I would, uh, I would be in my car and I would, the only time I would think like myself, like James, was when I was changing characters. Otherwise, I had made very, very long lists of, of everything that Jamie likes or believes or, or holds true about herself or about the world. And, and I answered them all and I studied them so I knew exactly who Jamie Thomas was. And the same thing with these other two characters. And when I would be in their costume, I would think like them, I would act like them, I would come from their reference point. Because all the ego really is, is a reference point, is how we present ourselves. And then when I, I'd go in the car and I would change, and at night I, I stayed in a, a, a homeless shelter as this uh, Bosnian refugee who didn't have a place to live. And, and when I was, and I spoke in a Bosnian accent, I'd been to Bosnia, so I knew what that sounded like. And my intention was to do this for about a week as an experiment to see, you know, what would happen. Well, I lasted about two and a half days. I couldn't do it anymore because I, I felt like I was literally going crazy. I was. I was losing myself. 
I, I didn't really know who I was anymore. I, I was literally becoming these other characters, but then I would shift and become another one and shift and become another one. And I was starting to fray at the edges. So for my own sanity, I decided to go ahead and stop after about two and a half days. And I remember I, I went back to our friend's house that I was staying at. And I remember immediately looking for, this was very instinctual, looking for the things that would reestablish James. My, I, I would brush my teeth in the same way I brush my teeth every single day of my life. I remember going to a cafe on the corner, which I went to every day to get the same thing every day, a snickerdoodle coffee, a cookie, and uh, my, my cafe latte. I was, I was reestablishing the identity of me because it had become, it was dissolving. That was a very interesting experience for me. And as I said in the beginning, it showed me that these ego identities, which we think are so solid and so concrete, are not. Given the right opportunity, they shift and change and adapt. Now, why am I telling you all this? Last night, a group of us here watched a remarkable movie. I don't know how many of you have seen the movie. Uh, this is not the movie we watched last night, but there's another movie called Man on the Moon. It's the, a movie about uh, Andy Kaufman. You probably remember Andy Kaufman. Creative genius, completely crazy. He had a sense of humor unlike any other comedian, did the strangest things. So they made a movie about him that starred Jim Carrey. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's a great movie. You should watch it, but you should definitely watch the movie about the making of that movie called Jim and Andy. Jim and Andy is a documentary that they shot while they were making Man in the Moon about Jim's process becoming Andy Kaufman. So Jim is very much a method actor and when he entered into that character and began playing that role, he didn't leave. Now, here's the, the other problem with that is Andy was more than one character. There was also, um, what's the other guy's name? The crazy guy? Uh, it'll come to me. There was all, well, there was Latka. There were all these other characters, but one of Clifton, Tony Clifton was this lounge singer alter ego of of Andy Kaufman. And so Jim, in playing this role, would, would play each one of them, and he drove everyone on the set nuts. The director thought he was going to go insane. They, uh, there was a comment at one point that there's going to be many lawsuits when they're done shooting this film for uh, the, causing emotional distress. And that was all Jim, because he wouldn't leave the character of Andy. And so I want to play a clip um, at the end of, of that documentary of Jim talking about what it was like for him coming out. And you're going to you're going to find this very interesting. The whole movie is basically A Course in Miracles or non-duality. And and we're watching it last night, just amazed at what he was saying. So we don't usually show little clips like this, but today we're going to. So just relax, and I'm going to go ahead and do a screen share so you guys can see this. Uh, <coughs> I didn't know who I was anymore. I didn't care. Well, why is it doing that? There's a bunch of different things from Michael Stipe, but uh, to me, Andy was the great beyond. I don't know why it's not showing the picture. Let me try something here. If not, we can just listen to what he says. I'm showing it on mine, but not on the screen. We're just gonna, I, I don't wanna play with it. Just go ahead and listen to what he says because most of this is just Jim in front of a camera talking. I didn't know what my politics were. I, I couldn't. I couldn't remember. 
<laughs> what I was about. <laughs> Suddenly I was so unhappy and I, and I realized that I was back in my problems. I was back in my heartbreak. And suddenly I, I thought to myself, you felt so good when you were being handy. Because you were free from yourself. You were on vacation from Jim Carrey. So you step through the door not knowing what's on the other side. And what's on the other side is everything. You know, everything. There's a feeling of uh, relief when this vehicle is traveling through space. Trying to like grasp on to stuff like fucking countries and religions and um, and I find it all so abstract. Why am I an American? Why am I Canadian? What is that? What does that mean? Somebody put a line down and said this is that. You know, uh, you know, we're so much more than we like are born into a family. So we're told what our family name is, and then your parents choose a name, and they say, your name will be Joel. It means the awesomeness of Yahweh, you know, and you have to live up to that, dude. And uh, we're counting on you not to make us look bad. And you're going to go to Harvard, and you're going to be a doctor, and you're going to be, and by the way, you're a Catholic, or you're a Jew, or you're, you know, whatever you are. It's like everything is so, are these abstract structures that you're given. And, and it's supposed to hold you together somehow, you know? And I've just given them up, you know? I don't need to be held together. I'm fine just floating through space like Andy, you know, just flying 6,000 miles an hour around the sun, you know? Balancing on tectonic plates that are floating on lava, you know, ready for the end times to occur and whatever the hell is going to happen. I'm just great. That's, that's all great. That's all great. You're on a spiritual journey, period. And we're all going to end up in the same place if there is such a thing. And maybe there isn't. Maybe it's just this and that's it. Me and Tito, that's it. There's us. We're the universe, man. I like that. That's fine. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know what else to say about all this. I think I'm tapped out. Okay. You know, unless, uh, I wonder, I wonder if I could do that with other people. I wonder, I wonder what would happen if I decided to just be Jesus. <laughs> wow, we're going to some crazy shit. <laughs> okay. I, I wish you could see it too, but you could certainly hear these conceptual ideas that seem to hold us together, but they only seem to hold us together, this, these identities in place. But then when you realize just how weak those concepts are and how quickly they'll adapt, as Jim found out becoming Andy Kaufman or as someone like Daniel Day-Lewis finds out playing Lincoln for seven or eight months while they're shooting that movie. Not leaving that character, he becomes Abraham Lincoln. When, when he finished playing that role, it took him three days to get his Irish accent back. And yet I say, this is who I am. I'm James Twyman. This is my body, my personality. I like all of these things. I don't like all these other things. It's nothing. And the sooner I am willing to just relax and realize, no, I'm a holy, perfect child of God. No, I am everything. And just let myself expand into that everything. 
you get to the point that Jim was expressing where I don't really care about anything else. There's nothing else I need. That's a very freeing place to get to the, the point where you don't need anything. You just relax. So, I hope I'm making sense. I'm going to let Vicki take it from here and see if she can make more sense of it. Vicki, what do you think about all that? That's great, Jimmy. What you're describing is what many call Alzheimer's. We lose our identity. We lose our personality that we've grown accustomed to, you know, the face and all the rest of it. And I've said this before too, this is a short story of my dear friend, Lydia, who um, was just a natural, naturally herself, natural Christ mind, had healed easily from cancer and lived another 20 years into her 90s by no doctors or any medicines, just by loving everyone. And I went and her son called me and said, oh, you got to go see my mother. She's in the nursing home, but she can't remember anything. And she probably won't know who you are. So don't feel bad. I said, oh, no problem. I go and see her. And I said, Lydia, Lydia, I'm Vicky. I'm one of your dearest friends. And I love you so much. Oh, she said, Vicky, I don't remember you, but I do know that I love you now. Isn't that it? She was, so she had always been losing her sense of identity and she lost the identity of an old lady with cancer and she lost an identity. Remember they told her she had three weeks to live. She says, no one's gonna tell me how long I've got to live. That's God's business. And just ignored it, lived at least 15 more years. And we sat down and I said, Lydia, I brought you a book, a children's book that we could read together. Oh, that's so wonderful. And, and you know, that's really all that's happening to us. And if we let it happen, we're just not attached, I'm seeing, to the identity. And the best way I'm experiencing coming into that freedom, that's one of the reasons I've loved this year of everyone. It's been a year of time out from our identity, time out from all the roles and everything we've played. And one of the easiest ways to re-emerge as just a being of light is with children because children don't have big past references of who we are or what we are. My, my niece sent me a note because when the kids come, I play with them. And um, she showed her son, her four-year-old son, a picture of, I don't know, someone with a halo, an angel with a halo. And I had, um, sent them a valentine and this little four-year-old boy said oh does vicky have a halo too because she's our valentine fairy because they told because there's no identity in any of it with a kid a kid only responds to us being playful being light being ourselves and being with them and when we don't hold on to any of these things we find ourselves lighter with ourselves and um whether you call it alzheimer's or falling into a christ role so i played that game in, in life like i'll pretend okay i am the fully living christ and i'm going to go out to the store today and i'm just gonna no one's gonna know but i'm gonna be really blessing and healing the whole thing in my mind and it's fun because it's true. Anyway, mm -hmm. all the identities, we get comfortable with them. I'm comfortable with like the same t-shirt or the same cup of coffee every day. We get comfortable and it's okay. Just, it's not a big deal. And those are great examples. I watched a movie about Van Gogh and the actor, was it Anthony Quinn? I don't know who it was. Felt Kate went into that part and had a very hard time because he went into the depths of being miserable and that being lost. So let's fall into the depths of freedom. That's all we're here to do. And we let these, ident we look at them lightly, whatever ways. That was a fun way that you did. All right, take on, you know, Jamie at Thomas or this, but look, it's fun. And it is so movable. It's a, we're a movable feast. We can play it any way we want, but the easiest is to just, find out what it's like to play being ourselves. Just, just show up and be. Yeah. <laughs>
Thank you, Vicky. You know, Jim asks a really good question in that clip that we heard, which is, what if I pretended to be Jesus in the same way that I pretended to be Andy Kaufman and really, really did it? I mean, do it full on. Or maybe just to say to pretend to be the Christ, but to do it full on like he did. The, some of the most moving parts of this documentary uh, are when, uh, because he, he never leaves character, his his mom and dad, or no, his father and brother come to him who still had really, and sister, who still had really you know, big stuff to, to heal. And, and Jim was with them as Andy and they had huge healings together. Um, the, the daughter of Andy Kaufman, who he never met, came to him and, and they spent a couple of hours together just talking and, and sharing and healing because he was full on. He didn't do the, the Andy Kaufman thing halfway. He, didn't, he wasn't just Andy Kaufman when the director said action. He was Andy Kaufman for months. And, and, and I mean, the funniest thing about that whole process is I, I said before, he drove everyone crazy by, with his antics and the things that he would do as Andy. And he wouldn't let anyone call him Jim. When, when someone would come up to him and say, oh, Jim, I, I love your work. He said, well, okay, I'll, I'll tell Jim when I see him, but I'm not Jim, I'm Andy. So once again, what, what if we, in such a full-on way as Jim did, what if we pretended to be the Christ? Because as you said, Vicki, you're pretending something that's true. And when you pretend something that's true, the truth of that experience is natural and automatic. The problem is, in our identities, we've been pretending to be something that we are not, weak, vulnerable, but we've made it seem very real. The antidote is to pretend to be what you really are. Allow the truth to emerge by pretending it, and then it's no longer pretend, then it becomes real. What a fun thing. I, I really recommend that all of you see if you can find that documentary. It's just fabulous. It will blow your mind. So Teddy, would you like to share anything? You know, I could share something, but I don't even know if it has anything to do with what's going on in this room at this point in time. Because I just read something on Facebook about people who make I don't even know how to talk about this because it makes me, it's so crazy. So people are talking about God and, you know, the divine masculine and the divine feminine and, you know, God, this, this. And all I could see is, like, we really, no matter how we look at it, we're trying to make God in our image. Like, God's not masculine. He's not feminine. God is. And then we cease to speak. You know, so like the idea that we have to have a divine feminine and a divine masculine, it's always an attempt to make God in our image. And it's missed like so easily how we do it. And it really makes me laugh to think that like God is a like, you know, he's the divine masculine or the God has the divine feminine in him. You know, it, it, it's just crazy making because God is, we cease to speak, and we find out what he is. The way not to find out what he is, is to make him in our image and think we know. And, and we do it in such subtle ways. And when I heard this conversation about the divine masculine and the divine feminine, and you know, if you think God is divine masculine, you're a chauvinist. Well, Jesus was a chauvinist. He didn't know God then. You know, I don't know what to say about that. But like to find out what God is, as God is it, and we are uh, like in his image, he's not in our image. Like we are created in the image of God, in God's image. God isn't made into our image. And it's so subtle how we do that. And we're convinced we're right. It's just really, it's laughable. So I'm just laughing at that, and I have no idea if it has <laughs> anything to do with what you guys are talking about, to tell you the truth. <laughs> well, I, to me, what you're saying is just how we, we try to take 
uh, it's like making a sausage. You have this skin and then you try and put everything into it that you think you are rather than just let it be what it is. And uh, the, the line that kept coming to, to me as you were speaking, Teddy, was something from <clears throat> St. Francis when he said, God is, and that's enough. Just let that be enough. God is. We, we don't need to then <clears throat> project all of our beliefs about ourselves, which are not true in the first place, onto God and make God this or that or you know, and, and next thing you know, you have a Santa Claus up in the sky floating in a cloud writing down our sins. And people believe that. People, you know, for hundreds of years have literally believed that that's what God looks like, Santa Claus. I mean, that, that's insane. So may, maybe the beginning of the return to sanity is to realize that we are insane. The ego is always. <laughs> yes. insane. Always. It always is. The only way you can get sane is to realize you're not. <laughs> And that's and that's what the, that's why the course is so good. It's really you know saying, listen, man, you're crazy. It's not <laughs> judgmental. You just are, and now you can heal from being crazy without the admission that you're crazy. Why would you even think about healing? And everybody here is crazy. <laughs> that's all I can say. And we're here to get sane. I don't know, but you can't get sane by making God in our image. That's all I know. And we do it in such subtle ways you know, subtle ways, like call God a he, and, you know, all of a sudden you're a chauvinist because you've left out the divine feminine, you know? It's like, and, and, and then people claim they're not judging. You know, it's really wild. It's just so subtle, man, and that's what we got to watch for, the subtleness of our egoic attempt to that's not right. be who we are created as and to, right. and to think that we know what we are because we can think we can know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, go and watch that movie, Jim and Andy. It's on Netflix, so you can get it easily. And <clears throat> I mean, Andy Kaufman was crazy. He was insane, but he 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 forced us to look at ourselves. And Andy, the uh, Jim, the same thing. And these are just beautiful examples of what we're all called to do. So. Pretend to be who you really are and watch how quickly the experience of that beingness happens, collapses in all around you. So thank you, Vicki. Thank you, Teddy. What an interesting discussion. <laughs> so let's see if anyone has anything they would let, like to lay on the altar today. If you have a prayer or a uh, Anything at all, anything going on, just go ahead and say it out loud and we will together allow it to be done. <laughs> 